We're just starting the uh, live stream a couple minutes early. And uh, rather than you staring at me while I'm standing here at the pulpit, we're just going to let the live stream do its thing and allow people to catch up. Some of the devices or technology doesn't work for everyone. And they find that they, uh, by the time they can get onto the live stream, that I've gotten into uh, uh, the service a bit. So just uh, know that we're here. And uh, if you don't see anybody, because I'm going to walk away, uh, that uh, I'll be back in a couple of minutes to start the service. Good morning. Get your coffee ready. Wash your hands. morning everyone tuning in today or or later in the future if not getting the live stream at the moment i did mention last week that i would be starting future live streams with without me in view to allow some tuning in time to get the, the stream going before i start seems that some are having some difficulty or or delays occurs in the uh, the first part of the live stream uh, initially so to avoid anyone missing out on the very first uh, first part of the, the live stream uh, the live stream will start a few minutes before we're uh, ready to go. So happy Father's Day to all of our dads, past and present. As most of you are aware, the restrictions by the health department and the government have eased. And the good news is that we will soon be able to meet here at the church for Sunday worship services. Maybe some uh, are having their, their first worship service this morning, but I had scheduled a meeting with our church leadership before last week's announcement from uh, Premier McNeil to look at how we could prepare for reopening in the safest way possible. And thinking that the opening was down the road in time, we got caught not being ready. And this is why we're not meeting together 
at the church today as a congregation. But we do have a plan and uh, it's being approved by the leadership. And once that's been completed, the plan will be sent out to uh, the regular uh, attending worship uh, worshipers. And we've procured much of the needed supplies for reopening and have some work to do to prepare the church for our, our future services. So at the moment, I can't say with certainty when we reopen, but it's likely in the near future. And I'll be sure to let everyone know via email, Facebook, and good old fashioned telephone calls where it's necessary. Our church service will change a great deal and uh, I will still be live streaming the message portion of the service. I suspect that we'll find things to adjust and to readjust once we reopen. So that's just a couple of announcements for this morning. Uh, again, good morning and happy Father's Day to all of our dads present, uh, uh, past and present. And now uh, let me share some scriptures with you uh, that we'll be looking at this morning. The first is uh, from the Old Testament book, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 22, and I'm reading verses one to 12. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took the, with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for a place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. And he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they had reached the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withhold, withheld from me your son, your only son. And then we're skipping ahead to the New Testament in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. I'm reading verses 11 to 24. Jesus, uh, this is a series of parables that Jesus had been sharing, and this is one. He says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between the two sons. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Let's give God thanks for his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and your message this morning. We just ask that your spirit would help lay this word upon our hearts and souls in your message. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of us can likely remember 
our fathers or father figures giving us some sort of punishment for something that we had done wrong. We may have thought it so bad that our fathers would treat us this way. Even though we had done something that we weren't supposed to do, we felt it unfair that our dads would punish us. And I'm sure our fathers never took pleasure in, in handing out punishment for our wrongdoing. I'm sure that sometimes we were rebuked or corrected when we didn't even know we were in the wrong. That's the way it goes when you're learning. As children, we may have found it difficult sometimes to understand our fathers, and, and even now as we've grown up and we're children of God, we also find it difficult to understand or accept our Heavenly Father's discipline or his ways as well. I can recall that in my late teens, Dad would jokingly give me a slap in the back of the head. Not a, not a real hard slap, but just out of the blue and for no apparent reason. And I would say, well, what's that for, Dad? I didn't do anything. Well, knowing I had most likely had been up to something, he said, it's for something you've done that I don't know about, or something that you're going to do wrong a little later. Dad and I laughed about that years later. The love and guidance of a father something some of us may or may not have experienced. All of us who still have our earthly fathers still have the opportunity to learn from our dads. So often time slips away and many can now say that they, you know, we've missed out on some times and experiences because we didn't always listen to our fathers. Maybe sometimes we just chose not to take the time. Others have and have had great dads in close relationships with their fathers. In either case, we still have an all loving and all wise and guiding heavenly father. If our fathers, our earthly fathers, listen to our heavenly father, then there's a good chance we've received some of God's instructions through our dads. We forget, but our heavenly father knows everything about being a father. He is the father of us all. And when we look to our heavenly father's word, the scriptures, we find his love and his guidance for us. We can see where our dads got some of their advice and morals from that they in turn have handed down to some of us. Sometimes our dads did things that made no sense, but in the end, it was all because of their obedience to God, our Heavenly Father. When we were reading that account of Abraham and Isaac, just think about what Isaac was thinking when his father Abraham tied him down to the pile of wood on the altar that Abraham had just built. Isaac knew that they were going to make a sacrifice. He asked his father in verse 7 of Genesis 22, the fire in the woods here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? The next thing Isaac knows, he's bound and placed on the altar. Abraham knew that if God required him to give up his son, that God would supply another because of that promise that God had made to Abraham. And something I noticed just as I was reading the scriptures this morning, when Abraham addressed the servants, he says, you guys stay here until the boy and I are going to go over there, and then we will return. The promise from God that Abraham would be the father of many peoples and nations, not knowing that he was being tested, but Abraham was being obedient to God as he was told to take Isaac to the mountain and sacrifice him there. Now, to be clear, God has never intended, he's never asked, he's never told his people to sacrifice their own children. So let's get that straight. This is a test for Abraham. Now Abraham's reply to Isaac in verse 8 was, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham's faith was hoping and praying that another sacrifice would be provided, but none had appeared yet. Abraham continues with the process of the sacrifice, and this means uh, to go through with offering his son as the sacrifice. Abraham is ready to slay his son, Isaac, when the angel of the Lord stops him in verse 12. And Abra Abraham looked up and he saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. I want to point out that there's symbols of Christ in this Old Testament chapter. The first is Isaac. Isaac is a first and only son to Abraham, just like Jesus Christ is to God. Isaac is loved by his father, Abraham, just as Jesus is loved by God, his heavenly father. And according to the text, we don't hear that Isaac struggled against his father, but was being obedient and willingly allowed himself to be bound for sacrifice. Well, neither did Jesus fight his father, but he obeyed. Really, in a way, Isaac was received back from the dead 
because he was supposed to die in Abraham's mind. The ram is the second symbol of Christ as an innocent victim dying in the place of another, not to mention that he was caught by his head in thorns. God had spared the anguish and a broken heart for Abraham by substituting Isaac with the ram. But we know that God did not spare himself the heartache of sacrificing his own son, Jesus Christ, for us all. So we see how Abraham was obedient to his heavenly father and Isaac as a son. He learned a lesson of faith from his father, Abraham. What a lesson indeed. Abraham is told again the promise of God that God would bless Abraham and make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. The obedience of Abraham sure seems strange to us in this case, but this is a, an example of total obedience. It's an example of a father's tough love or actions from a father that doesn't make sense unless you factor in obedience to God into the equation. Thankfully, I have a different example of a father's love found in the New Testament, the reading of the parable of the lost or the prodigal son. This example is a bit easier to understand for us, and, and there is not an actual request for the sacrifice of any human. This parable reminds me of my dad and me in a sense. I wasn't the best behaved kid as I hit my teen years. I drifted away from God and, and really let loose. It seemed strange to me that dad didn't discipline me more. I wasn't complaining at the time. And he knew that I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. No drugs in the house was his only rule. But even when I broke that rule, well, he burned my stash in the stove and he pulled my plants out of the ground and broke them off and stuck alders in where my plants were. I don't need to tell you what kind of plants. He never did a thing or never said a thing about finding the plants in the woods. He just destroyed them. I didn't say anything earlier because I wasn't going to rock that boat. And who was I to argue? But I had this feeling for a number of, a year, number of years that my dad could really care less. Why hadn't he beat the bad out of me or grounded me or something other than nothing? I have more to say about dad's response a little later. In chapter 15 of Luke, we have an account of a father who had a rebellious son just like me. The father doesn't stop his son from his ways probably couldn't. His son wants to do what he wants to do when his father let him go. The son made foolish mistakes and really nearly ruined his life to the point where his life was in danger from starvation. Now I never came close to starving, but my life nearly ended a few times because of my actions. And all this time out of reach of his father in the parable and out of reach from my father in my teen years, these two sons did as they pleased only to find that this was not the life that was hoped for by them or anyone else. In verse 17 of Luke's reading today from uh, chapter 15, when the son came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to eat? Here I am starving to death. It was a threat of death that woke up our biblical son in Luke. And it was certainly the near death experience I had with cancer at 21 that would begin to wake up my heart and soul, helping me to come to my senses. All this time, our lost son in Luke was missed and mourned by his father, who willingly let him go and do as he pleased. His father had considered him dead, because in verse 24, the father says, For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now found. I come to know years later that my father prayed for me daily. Maybe there was times that he prayed all day. He had others praying for me and willing to try and reach out to me. There was a man that came to the place where I worked, Raymond Moore Jr., and asked me if I needed a place to stay. Well, I wasn't homeless at the moment. It was bad at home, and Dad thought maybe I would listen or behave differently in some other Christian's home. I was surprised that I was asked, you know, do you need a place to stay from someone? How could they know? And why would they care? As dad didn't, so I thought. No two relationships are the same. Dad didn't have a self-help books on how to raise a rebellious son or, or take the rebel out of the son. My father trusted his heavenly father to bring me back. It wasn't that my dad didn't care, but I know that if he had tried to rule me with more of an iron fist, that I may have went too far. 
And that rule may have had me never come to my senses. Dad had to let me go, but not without prayers for his heavenly father to protect me, to intervene. I won't go into all the times that I've nearly drowned, car accidents, a couple accidental overdoses, driving, well, when I shouldn't have been. Many of you know that it's a miracle that I'm alive and standing here today. A couple days ago, an old friend and I were sharing on Messenger, and she had thought that she had lost her child in the same way that maybe a lot of people have thought that I was lost as well. Lost her child to a dangerous, sinful lifestyle. Didn't seem that there was any coming back from that. But she also shared and she was praising God as her prayers were answered and, and God had returned her child, brought her around. And now her child is in Christian ministry. In today's day and age, if a Christian father wanted to discipline his child, their hands are tied, so to speak. Most often the discipline that one can feel on the backside, like many of us received when we were younger, well, it's not politically correct. It's not socially correct. It's not legal in many ways. Even though God, the father of us all, has told us in the Old Testament that if we spare the rod, we spoil the child. I was never beaten, nor no one should be. Yes, I was spanked a few times when I was little. I can honestly say that I'm probably better off for it, but at the time, I didn't see the value in it for sure. Dads have a huge responsibility these days. And the scary part is that many fathers out there today didn't or don't have godly teachings as their guide. Many are letting their kids do what they want, totally out of control, and they haven't even left elementary school yet. I'm sure that dad only had me in mind and not my sisters when he, he gave a te testimony at a Pentecostal church that he was attending. And he said during testimony time that he was thankful that none of his kids were in prison. Again, he wasn't thinking of my sisters, I'm sure. We need to remember the dads in our lives, the dads next door, the dads that we have as relatives and friends. They need our prayers and so too their children. When we look to the Father in Luke chapter 15, we, we see God. We can see God receiving each of us as we are all lost at one point in time in our past. I see God, but I also see my dad rejoicing at the fact that I had come home. I had come home to Christ. A lot of dads don't show much for emotion, especially the older generation of dads that some of us had or have. But that doesn't mean that they don't love their children. And sometimes tough love is required. Maybe, maybe it's in the form of discipline or maybe the tough love of having to let go and depending on our Heavenly Father to step in when we either don't have dads to guide us or we refuse to listen to godly advice from our dads. Either way, our Heavenly Father is the one who is father of us all. It's from his word that all of us, fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters, it's from God, our Heavenly Father, that we should get our guidance and encouragement from. Having a healthy relationship with God will help dads live lives that are example to their children. Guided by a God-fearing dad and then having the guidance of an all-loving Heavenly Father is crucial to our lives, no matter how young or old we may be. I know Father's Day brings mixed emotions to us. Some have lost their dads to age and time like me. Others have not had a father figure in their lives. And no matter where we fit in all of these possibilities, we do have a Heavenly Father willing to guide us, willing to take us under his wing of love, protection, and forgiveness. Though we may not always understand our fathers and sometimes especially God, we can trust God to be in our corner, that he knows best and wants the very best for us. This is why he sacrificed himself through Jesus Christ, his son. The sacrifice of Jesus has happened so that all of us could experience the love and forgiveness, the blessings, the goodness of God, our father and creator. Amen to that. Before we go into our prayer time this morning, we would all agree that godly instruction for children from their parents, the parents' example is very important valuable and important but what we see around in our lives and in the world for the most part is is lacking godly guidance from the parents and their instruction 
The responsibility is certainly shared between mom and dad. It's Father's Day, but let's pray this morning for our fathers and mothers, especially those who are in our lives as family and friends, that these moms and dads will see the vital importance of, of godly teaching, that these parents will seek the Lord in his advice, raising their children, because the children are our next generation of Christians in our world. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are father of us all. And we thank you, Lord, for our fathers, whether they have been great dads and, and taught us about you, or maybe dads who have failed us in some way. Even in failures, Lord, we've been blessed because we learn from their mistakes. Lord, when we consider all the families and friends represented in our lives this morning, it would be a great multitude of people. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of all the parents who have uh, not thought it important to guide and teach their children about you and your ways, your love, and your promises. Help moms and dads of this generation to see that teaching their children about you and your ways, your morals are so vital for their well-being of them as children now and as they grow up, and for all of us for the eternal destination of our children and families. Lord, as we serve you, all will go well with all in the end, that your blessings will last for eternity. We pray that parents will realize they have a responsibility to teach their children and to live for you. We pray for dads and moms that do acknowledge you and serve you, Lord, to help them, to strengthen them, to guide them, as they teach their children, as they raise their children. Lord, you know it's becoming harder to compete with the world. And dads and moms, their children, it's a tougher situation. So help, Lord, help each of us as your servants to do our part in teaching everyone about you. Those that you put in our path to teach them about you are almighty and powerful, loving and merciful, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for the day you've given us. We thank you for those who work to supply our health care and our food and our protection. Be with them and protect them. Be with those, Lord, who mourn the loss of loved ones. Grant them comfort and strength through your word, through your spirit, through your salvation, through Jesus Christ. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A blessing upon your day for each of you and your families, where you, wherever you are, near and far. We pray the Lord's blessing of protection and guidance upon you. So we will see you again, uh, hopefully uh, in person in the near future, and uh, have a blessed day and a blessed week. Don't forget, you need to wash your hands.